Sisters, we carry their genes, when the pyramids went up 5,000 years ago, they were doing something somewhere, where were they 10,000 years ago? when a stone hole like this first broke soil. But our trail goes back long before the beginning of agriculture. For the first people built head to toe like us lived in Africa 130,000 years ago. Our ancestors would have been among them but two million years before there were any people who looked like us, stones were being struck together in Africa to form tools that would chop, penetrate and cut. The makers walked like us, but their heads were much smaller with brain cavities only one half as large as ours. But walking as we do, had begun even before the first stone toolmakers by individuals with brain cases only slightly larger than chimpanzees. Whoever were our remotest ancestors, each lived long enough to become a parent. Otherwise, we would not be here. We are at the tip, if we have children near the tip, of an offshoot that apparently budded from a branch of the tree of life between four and five million years ago, perhaps earlier. For it is from this time that anatomical evidence comes of the first existence of bipedal primates, primates who walked habitually on two legs. Several millions of square miles of Africa's forests were then dying off from a prolonged dry spell, leaving in their place more open woodlands and savanna. The new bipedal primates, the hominids, left the greater safety of the diminishing forests and ventured into more open country. Their fossilized remains have been found at locations in Africa more than a thousand miles apart from South Africa to East Africa. Most primates remained quadrupedal and remained in what was left of the forests. Some quadrupedal primates, such as baboons, also left the shrinking forest to range far and wide into the more open country. Quadrupedal locomotion enabled them to retain their speed of movement. Not having to use limbs to carry their young also helped. The success of the baboons sharpens the question as to how and why habitual bipedalism emerged. Both the number and sequence of the anatomical and behavioral changes involved remain almost a complete mystery. Although bipedal walking enables an uninterrupted view of the horizon and reduces the amount of the body surface exposed to direct solar radiation, it slows running speed considerably and requires mothers to carry their babies, a burden and a further drag on speed. Even the greatest speed of baboons compared to that of bipedal primates is no match for the speed and power of leopards. But the landscapes traversed by our early hominid ancestors were also patrolled by saber-toothed tigers, giant pigs, bears 12 foot tall, and species of wolves now extinct. One hominid skull has been found with a bite mark of a great cat that penetrated the brain. In fact, 
None of the bipedal primate lines that evolved during the period of deforestation persisted to the present, except one. This is the skull of one of several lines that eventually reached a dead end, for reasons unknown. For reasons equally unknown, our ancestral line was not extinguished and continued to produce offspring. Brain size increased. More thought and skill went into the shaping of tools. Migration out of Africa began. Fire making technique was discovered. From 70,000 years ago comes the first communication record. It was found in a South African cave by the seashore. It is an incised ochre plaque. The ochre had been brought into the cave from a site 70 miles distant. The incisions convey the meaning, though not to us. Then, within the last 30,000 years, in several regions of the world to which hunter-gatherers had spread from Africa and in Africa, out of the blue, our ancestors began to paint. I shall show only some of the paintings and engravings from one region, Southern Africa. Unlike European cave art, which is focused on animals, the Southern African tradition not only has a much broader range of subject, also it is unique in that it portrays hunter-gatherer life at its summit and then depicts stages towards its almost complete destruction. It is estimated that more than two million individual images were painted and engraved on the rock faces and boulders of Southern Africa until 1866, when the last known hunter-gatherer painter was shot in the mountains of Lesotho, with ten horn pots hanging from a belt around his waist, each with a different color paint. We don't know who sang the first song or played the first instrument. The earliest probable arrow parts, ivory shafts and stone blades, dating from 20,000 years before the present, suggest that someone had invented the bow and arrow. Whoever plucked a bowstring may have given birth to instrumental music. The hunting bow here rests on a calabash or tortoiseshell resonator. The stick in the musician's right hand is either being drawn across the bowstring or he is striking it percussively. Quite a stylishly dressed audience. The man on the lower right is wearing a cap with animal ears. We see a bracelet around his waist and a knee band. They seem relaxed and appreciative Perhaps they were singing. The sounds you hear in the background were made with the same instrument, but of course recently in the Kalahari Desert, among one of the few surviving hunter-gatherer groups who no longer paint. Who are these? Baby buck brought in from the felt by the artist or a friend of the artist? Set on a ledge near a rock face, the artist ready with stick brush and paint pots? Or a vision from the artist's mind, the baby bucks and bag not physically there? He or she might have come out of a trance dance. The dance where you dance yourself to the finest edge of physical exhaustion and then decide to cross or not to cross. The artist may have been one of the few who decided to cross. 
This may have been his report back. We have all been invited to life. Perhaps something that the artist's friends and family already knew, but appreciated being reminded of. The baby bucks in the skin bag with the streamers on the rock face were the reminder. They were hunters and they were gatherers, bearers and transmitters of the longest and most forgotten experience of our species. It was take a life or die, a mystery in which we are also ensconced. Nobody to kill for them, no slaughterhouses, no meat counters, no vegetable aisles, no shops, no houses, only mountain, forest, plain, and river. Men went and got the meat. They needed perseverance and bravery, knowledge too. The older you were, the more you had. And intelligence, if seen to be lacking in this, who would want to go hunting with you? Because a mistake, there were enough of these, could kill someone. First timers were taken under wing. They were well equipped with gifts handed down from ancestors long forgotten. They had the longbow, which, when firing a large arrow with a wide cutting head, could bring down an elephant. And they had the short bow with a range of less than 75 feet. Its small arrow was not deadly. But an ancestor had discovered, perhaps in the wake of bitter experience, that the larvae of a certain beetle contained a poison which could be coated on the tip of a reed-shafted arrow. And while fatal to prey when conveyed into their bloodstream, the meat is unaffected. In camp, these arrows are reversed in quivers that were hung out of the reach of children for there is still no known antidote to the poison. The southern Africa of the hunter-gatherers was a very different world from what it became after the arrival of farmers with rifles. Even in the mid-19th century, European painters were still documenting the presence of great herds. Elephant rivers had not yet become mere place names. This procession of Eland is a reminder. The Eland is the world's largest antelope. Powerful, intelligent, it can leap eight feet from a near standing stop. They are memorialized across southern Africa. The dispatch that a shot from an arrow coated with a slow-acting poison was, if possible, to drive them over a cliff. Hit with an arrow, with one bound, a large antelope would be off.
They might spend days tracking the spore of the wounded animal, but they were experts. A young man is said to have fallen in love with the footprints of an unknown girl. A child recognizes the footprint of his mother as well as her face. Only when light failed would they rest sleeping in the open, listening to the black-backed jackal howling through the darkness. Sunup and the spore, once cleanly delineated, now signaling the animal's declining strength. The hoof prints becoming dirtier with soil disturbance, the animal beginning to totter and sway. Finally, the end, provided that other predators had not arrived first. Carcass to be cut up if too large to carry. Eland weigh three quarters of a ton and more. Here, a large carcass has been cut up and the burden of return to camp shed. Quite unfamiliar to us was the economic system of hunter gatherers. Everyone received an equal share, even families whose males had not participated in the hunt. It has been reported that an orange given today to one member of a Kalahari hunter-gatherer band is peeled, divided into segments, and even parts of segments which are handed out. And a cigarette made from a sprinkle of tobacco in a scrap of newspaper is handed around until the smoke gets into everybody's lungs. To satisfy their sweet tooth, people watch the birds in particular for an appearance by the honey guide. Considerable as their zoological knowledge was when it came to locating bees' nests, they recognized that the honey guide knew more, so they followed its flight and helped themselves, irrespective of the consequences. While men hunted, women gathered. Because hunting success was unpredictable, families depended on the women to provide food consistently. Again, gatherers left the campsite every morning, their babies and digging sticks with them, and children old enough to persevere over distance. If the ground was expected to be hard, a stone was first shaped to reduce drag, then a hole was bored through its core. This was accomplished without a lathe and without an electric drill. But as we shall see, hunter-gatherers were not pressed for time. The bored stone was then jammed over a stick to provide more heft for reaching roots and tubers. In the sandy soils of the Kalahari, an unweighted pointed stick suffices. The women's attire, thanks to a remote ancestor who had invented clothing, was leather, and in the colder uplands, also fur. Women wore a karas, or cloak. On gathering expeditions, a supersized pouch held the day's collection of food. A rope bag made from bark held ostrich shell containers of water. A leather harness around the back tied at the chest for the baby, leaving arms free. There were also small pouches and handbags appear in many of the paintings. Streamers, fringes, and patterns were stitched stylishly into cloaks. 
Who was the first woman to don jewelry or style her hair? And men? Men wore headbands, necklaces, arm and wristbands, leg bands, and painted their bodies. Gathering fruits, berries, wild vegetables, and medicinals, and fetching water might be considered in one respect more dangerous than hunting. Women left camp unarmed, the paintings show, and this is the case also with a handful of gatherers left in the Kalahari. Elizabeth Marshall Thomas, in a simple and beautifully written article appearing some years back in a journal of anthropology, relates her experience on the subject of behavior in an environment inhabited by free-roaming predators. She reports that the people she was with slept in the open without fences or dogs to protect against lions. When lions visited their camp at night, the lions would be yelled at to go away. And they went away. Two other incidents reported are, first, when she, together with a hunting party of four men, went to investigate why some vultures were sitting in a tree. They found the remains of a lion killed, and a number of lions lying near some bushes. Nothing escaped the eyes of the Kalahari hunters, as they simply helped themselves to the kill which the vultures apparently had feared to do. On another occasion, after having shot the wildebeest with a poison arrow and tracking him, the hunters eventually found him. But 30 lionesses and a male lion had found him first. The quotation on screen from her article describes what happened next. Eventually, all the lions left, and the hunters butchered the wildebeest. As already seen in some of the paintings, Live and Let Live was not the relationship between the two groups of predators consistently. But other paintings showing unarmed women going on gathering expeditions suggest that non-belligerency was probably the general state of affairs. Taught through example by lionesses to young lions and hunter-gatherers to their children and extending probably far back in time to a definite encounter or series of encounters between these predators, the details of which are completely lost. Hunting and gathering was the governing way of life for more than a hundred thousand years. For 92% of the time that humans like us have been on Earth. During all that time, babies were being born and, as now, brought to adulthood with nutrition, and education. No tasks were imposed on children by adults, although children sometimes imitated the work of adults. But there was no child labor in the hunter-gatherer world. Nor were children confined in classrooms. They learned the responsibilities they would later assume as adults without any formal training.
play and work would be hard to distinguish, even for adults. We consider hunting a sport. And picking fruits, nuts, and berries for personal consumption, a form of recreation. Of course, hunting and gathering were then necessary, not leisure activities. Yet studies have shown that 20 hours of effort a week was all that was required to put bread on the table and clothes on the back, leaving hunter-gatherers with more than twice as much leisure time as we have. It was an easy-going life. An anthropologist has described hunter-gatherers as the first affluent society. Helpers came free of charge. Here, a stone knife is being used. No work was required to meet mortgage payments. Home for a day, a week or more, was a rock shelter. or a grass hut. Or a reed shelter. There was no interest in working to acquire possessions beyond the few essentials for survival. Because when a move had to be made, the lighter the burden, the more comfortable the trek. Indeed, among predators, only the pure carnivores have more free time than human hunter-gatherers. There was no quarreling over food. Meat from the hunt was shared out to everyone. Old, sick men who didn't hunt, younger men who had stayed in camp, women and children. As there was no government to support, there were no taxes to pay. Government was simply the adults in camp, usually no more than 25 to 60 individuals of both sexes and all ages. There were no chiefs. No votes were taken. Conversation decided issues. The quantity of wild edible plants within a comfortable daily commute for female gatherers limited the size of the band. The larger the band, the sooner the wild foods within easy walking distance of the camp would be exhausted, and the more frequent the need to move camp. Necessarily, most of our ancestors, like these people, were nomads. Beyond their abandoned campsites was space, as far as the eye could see, and further. It is reckoned that each hunter-gatherer band lived off an average of four to five hundred square miles. But the space that sustained the band large as it had to be was not boundless. Beyond eyesight, in several directions, were other great spaces, each with its small band of hunter-gatherers. Continuous enlargement of band size would not have been sustainable. Good rains, good grasses did accommodate temporary enlargements, but if too many babies were brought to adulthood when nature was good, what happened when nature turned bad? Was this one result? This is a copy of a painting from a site called, because of the painting, Battle Cave. A 
a photograph of one part only of the same painting. At the top right, a man is pulling an arrow out of his arm. And at the bottom right, a man prone and bleeding from his arm. Meanwhile, arrows are flying. In another part of the same painting, women are attempting to hold men back from the fray. Why? Was this a battle within a band? This is from another site more than a hundred miles away. An attempt at peacemaking? Not here. Aside from population growth on finite land, what else lay behind outbreaks of violence between groups and within groups? Practically everything material was shared. Robbery and its retribution were not issues. Sexual trespassing? Outbreaks of severe mental instability as we have in present day society? Individuals who scorn the belief of their fellows? Other paintings are as hard to understand. Kalahari hunter-gatherers are said to have named baboons the people who sit on their heels. But here, hunter-gatherers are clubbing baboons to death. while baboon mothers try to reach safety. This scene has been described as a baboon hunt, but it's hard to credit that the baboons were killed for meat. Perhaps baboon feeding habits overlooked during a period of plenty would not be tolerated when there was not enough to go around. Or perhaps this violence was a reaction to something a baboon had done. This is also puzzling. More than 50 armed men striding forward. Too many men to be a hunting party. Surely hunter-gatherers suffered from the death of those they had loved and endured pain and infirmity and tried to cope. Dacha, or as we say marijuana, was one method of coping. Painting over earlier paintings was not undertaken to ruin the work of other painters. It was but another method of coping. What was on the mind of those who came to add new visions to old? Did hunter-gatherers believe as later generations did that events which bring suffering and joy are not the product of lifeless forces but are willed by an unseen being. Were these rock faces their scriptures, and was each new painting a service? Their symbols do not have meaning for us. Who are these human-like figures at the top who seem to have fringes at the shoulders instead of arms? When in the sequence of paintings was the human group at right center placed on the rock face? Why? What question of these people was answered by that strange flying figure with wings like the flowering shoots of grasses that is just above and to the left of the human figures? Why was it painted there rather than on an empty part of the rock face? Here too a question. The artist would have known that an antelope would not be fooled by a hunter attempting this disguise. Therefore, this can be no human hunter. This also is no human in disguise. Nor these. Hunters might disguise their heads with animal-like headgear, but not their feet with cloven hooves. These are neither human nor animal but special beings. These paintings are religious paintings. 
part of a lost religious tradition, a tradition unfamiliar to us and therefore somewhat disturbing. Unlike images from living religious traditions like the Christian tradition of a god in human form walking on water, or even from a living tradition perhaps not our own, like a Persian painting depicting the Islamic tradition of Muhammad ascending to heaven and returning to earth on an animal with a horse's body, a peacock's tail, and an angel's head. These paintings in their rock shelters strike no emotional chord in us. They are meaningless to us, but they must have once helped people to cope. Just as religious art, the worship services, and the buildings of present-day religions help many to cope. Another way hunter-gatherers relieved stress and pain was through dancing. Among the dancers was the healing dance, attempted by only a few who managed without drugs to dance through pain and the fear of death to a state which gave them, briefly, confidence to handle fire with their bare hands and walk through it, and the confidence to heal the afflicted. Another means of coping with the mystery in which all dwell was the story. Here is one.
A time came, though, when hunter-gatherers were overwhelmed, unable to cope. They were dispossessed of nearly all of their hunting and gathering lands. Most of them and their children lost their lives. The worldwide disappearance of hunter-gatherers is almost complete. It began in the Middle East 10,000 years ago with the emergence of agriculture. 8,000 years later, that is 2,000 years ago, stock breeders, the first agents of destruction, reached southern Africa. Hunter-gatherer painters recorded the first signs, the movement into the region of animals hitherto unknown, fat-tailed sheep, goats, and cattle. A cow's udder received detailed attention from an artist. And the people who traveled with these animals was noted. Later, these people were also depicted by whites, who called them Hottentots. But the herders referred to themselves as Koikoi, real people. The Koiko had another name for hunter-gatherers, San, the first of many names applied to them by subsequent newcomers, names like Sarwa, Roa, Twa, Bushman. In appearance, the Koikoi were not dissimilar to the hunter-gatherers themselves. Their languages were related, both groups were light of complexion, both, especially women, had pronounced diatopigia, protruding buttocks. But their habits were different. Koi Koi drank the milk of their animals. A hunter-gatherer, a European artist, recorded had a try at this. Because of milk, 200 to 600 koikoi could live together in a single camp. Their cattle pastured on the lands of the hunter-gatherers, shown here hiding from koikoi. Koikoi rarely kill their own animals, preferring to keep them for milk and instead to hunt for meat. Seasonally, and as pastures became overgrazed, they moved their camps. Their needs trumped the hunter-gatherers' needs, and the region's hunter-gatherer population, always small, now became smaller. Next, from the hotter lands to the north came an even more numerous people, darker in appearance than both the hunter-gatherers and the koikoi. These newcomers refer to themselves as Untu, also meaning people. They too brought animals with them, as the Koikor had done. They too drank milk, but unlike the Koikor, these people broke open the soil and dropped seeds into it and ate what came up. They raised this food abundantly, but in small spaces, and this and the milk from their grazing cattle fed many. And so their individual homesteads multiplied. And in drier areas, where water was scarcer, they built towns, more people associating together than a hunter-gatherer could have imagined. Hunter-gatherer artists noted the fearsome blades carried by the Untu, who made them by putting a kind of rock into a fire. Hotter than any hunter-gatherer fire and their menfolk carried shields to deflect arrows. Not even the Koi Koi could resist their intrusion, which was permanent 
and ever more extensive. Some hunter-gatherers continue to make a living by fishing in rivers and along the coasts. The Untu then had a taboo against eating fish. Some hunter-gatherer people found temporary refuge on high mountain slopes and valleys, and in the semi-deserts and deserts. By the time five centuries ago that the next group of strangers set foot in the region, depicted here meeting Khoi Khoi on the beach of what would become Cape Town, zones with more than 15 inches of annual rainfall were already under the occupation of Khoi Khoi and Untu. These later strangers, here seen by hunter-gatherer artists, call themselves Blancas, or Whites, and Christians. They call the hunter-gatherers Bushmen, and refer to the Untu by a word that means unbeliever. They brought horses and firearms with them. Within a few generations, the traditional spaces of the remaining hunter-gatherers were progressively occupied by sheep and goats and cattle. Wild animals disappeared, some as a result of massive hunts, such as this, entitled, quote, The Greatest Hunt in History Near Bloemfontein, arranged for the visit of Prince Albert in 1861, unquote, in which 40,000 animals were said to have been killed. With the advance of the domestic herds, hunters who made off with or shot these animals suffered a similar retribution at the hands of whites as they had earlier at the hands of Khoi Khoi and Untu. The last rock painting documents both stock theft, as the herding peoples regarded this, and the retribution, sometimes in the form of large sweeps by private commandos and soldiers. The extinction of the ancestral human economy in the region was also captured by white painters, and later by photographers. Did these people know how close their end was? Some captured hunter-gatherers were incarcerated in Cape Town's Breakwater Prison for stock theft. Others became house servants, field servants, and herders to the incoming groups. And on occasion they were depicted as objects of ridicule. The title of this 1865 watercolor by Thomas Baines is instructive. Quote, the Makwa Hottentot on riding ox and his bushmen. Some hunter-gatherers and their children were taken overseas for exhibition.
These were the last hunter-gatherers to be photographed in South Africa. Their painting and engraving sites do remain. Some like this one at Brantflay, in view of a farm and the farmer's residence. In South Africa, a small community, no longer hunter-gatherers, but speaking their ancient language, continued to exist. A census taken in 1957 set the number of such people in the whole country at 20. Our ancestral way of life continued to be practiced in the drier parts of Southern Africa, the Kalahari, until the last quarter of the 20th century. Then it came to an end there too. Here's the end. The suitcase, the iron cooking pots, the fire drill is being used in the old way, but the tinder is paper. And the clothes, clothes that no longer are leather, which were one reward of hunts, hunts that used to be talked about well into the night. No, homemade leather clothes are no more. These clothes are the product of a different kind of life. A marginal life, in between two different ways of life. These are no longer hunter-gatherers. They are lucky to have jobs on a white or black man's farm, which used to be their grandparents' land. These people are not as lucky. No jobs. They are among former hunter-gatherers who have become so-called squatters on government or private land. People who vegetate, with little to do but wait for government or missionary handouts. During the 1970s and 80s, when these pictures were taken, there was a spike in employment opportunity when the South African and Portuguese military, in their campaigns against the independence movements, recruited young men from this and similar places for their tracking skill. They were well paid, able to help their families, but when Angola and Namibia became independent, the young Bushman soldiers returned home without prospects, some with an acquired taste for drink. Unlike the branch and grass shelters of past times, these dwellings are bigger and sturdier, built for a long stay, longer, much longer, than the time of stay in any one place by members of their nomadic grandparents' generation. Provision for privacy, too. Corrugated iron sheets. Not like the old days when there was little privacy. When companionship was wanted more than privacy. And so, the hunting and gathering way of life has come to an end. Whether the quality of human life has improved over time is a question, even if possible to define, no one is in a position to answer. The pages of time keep turning, and like the hunter-gatherers, we have no control over what turns up.
Thank you.